Hey, this is Brett, and you're watching Brett and Some Books. Please like and share. I mean, I'm so, and subscribe. Uh, we are continuing the Bosnia list today on Chapter 3, and this is written by Keenan Trabinchevic and Susan Shapiro. Chapter 3, The Last Muslim Family in Birchkal, Bosnia, May 1992. The tall military, paramilitary, pointing his AK-47 rifle at us, had a beard down to his chest and dark glasses. Despite the suffocating 95-degree heat, he wore an all-black uniform buttoned up to his Adam's apple. The bayonet in his holster hung halfway down his thigh. His shajaka, a flat hat decorated with a skull and two bones, showed he was a Chetnik gorilla, a group notorious for cutting off the testicles and spooning out the eyes of civilians. The motherfucker gave me chills. My mother's chin was trembling. It was the end of May and the first time we tried to escape Birchkow. My stubborn father, believing the conflict would be over quickly and nothing bad would happen to us, made us wait too long. At twelve, I already understood that the politics of my country depended on our strategically located city, located close to Cro the Croatian, Serbian, and Bosnian borders. Eldon said that whoever ruled Birchkal ruled all of Bosnia. Fortunate, unfortunately, that was now the Orthodox Christian Serbs, like the cycle holding us at gunpoint. When we'd boarded the bus to Vienna an hour earlier, we thought we'd make it out. But then, the pyrometal factory checkpoint, the black-clad gorilla had stomped aboard, demanded to see our ID. Then he yelled, Get the fuck off! He obviously read our Muslim name, reason enough for us to be annihilated. You're not going anywhere, he said. I'm going to kill you. We climbed off the bus and stood by the side of the road as he commanded, a recent TV report I'd seen detailed how Chetniks had slit throats and sliced off Muslims' ears and fingers. I was shaking. If he was going to murder us, I hoped he'd shoot us fast and not engrave crosses on our foreheads, the signature Chetniks left on their Muslim victims. The guerrilla went to talk to another soldier, a four-door Stoyadin, stopped in front of us. That's my co-worker, Slobodan. Mom said, hopefully. I remembered him being a nice prankster from her company's soccer tournament. He'd called me Little Kika and showed me some soccer moves. Slobodan rolled down his car window. We need help. We have the right paperwork. Would you vouch for us? She asked breathlessly. Sheriff Slobodan said, These papers are legit. They'd let us go. He took the papers through the window and studied them. These are no good, he threw them back at my mother, closed his window, and drove off. My mother picked up the papers from the ground, shaking and sweating. I can't believe that piece of trash, Dad muttered under his breath. I thought he was her good friend from childhood. Then I remembered hearing two weeks earlier that Slobodan Todorovic told us that Slobodan Tesic was the one who told soldiers that Eldon and I had flown Islamic flags. To our right, we saw four short men in green fatigues standing at the control booth, stopping cars and trucks driving past. As our tormentor walked over to say something to the group, a bald soldier in an oversized green uniform came up to us. Hey, Kekka, he said quietly. Milan. My father recognized him from a soccer team he'd coached. Another chance. I'm so sorry, Kika. Sir John's in charge. Milan looked down. Nobody could protect us here. When the bearded psycho came back, he told Mom, You lady, you could come and cook us some bean soup. Did that mean she, he was going to rape her? I'd seen reports about what the Chetniks had done to Croatian women. My mother didn't move. He loaded his rifle and ordered us to march forward. We lined up next to each other, holding our bags by our sides. 
we started walking up the one lane highway away from Birch Cow. I heard the psycho cock his gun. Just keep moving. Don't stop, Dad whispered. Don't turn around. Waiting to be shot in the back, I broke into a cold sweat. I was wearing three shirts and a thick jacket. We'd taken only one duffel bag each, so we dressed in layers. I struggled to keep up with Eldon. Mom, exhausted, was crying, falling behind. I took hold of a strap of her bag to help. Sweat stung my eyes. After a long, flat block, the road climbed. When I eventually looked back, I could no longer see Sir John the Psycho. I wondered if he had been distracted by a car pulling up or the arrival of other Muslims he could terrorize. Had Milan diverted his attention? I put my bag down, wiped sweat from my face on my shirt. I could breathe again. I relaxed my soldiers, thanking God we weren't going to be shot today. So they didn't kill us, didn't want us here, but wouldn't let us leave here. What now? We were stranded on the highway. The only way back to the home we were thrown out of was blocked by the psycho at the checkpoint behind us. We couldn't escape to the suburbs in the south since the front lines dividing Serb and Bosnian armies were drawn between us and our birch cow apartment. The sole way east was through Serbia, a sure path to death. To the left was the river Sava, dividing Bosnia from Croatia, but the bridge was destroyed. We worried that landmines would explode if we stepped off the pavement. Trucks of Serb soldiers passed, waving three-fingered salutes. Were they mocking us, or did they think we were Serb refugees? When we realized we were heading toward Aunt Besira's rural village just five mi miles away, we decided to stay with her. It was a two-hour walk, carrying our bags in dry heat. At our village's entrance, we now found a ramp with the Serbian patrol who stopped us. This is the detention center, a soldier said. All men over 18 have to sign in twice a day and get the number. Eldon and Dad complied. Let's no Muslim or Catholic males can escape to fight, my brother explained on the 20-minute trek uphill to Besirras. On the way, stray dogs, chickens, and cows who'd been let out of their stables roamed around, looking as lost as we did. This was farm country. The red brick house Besirra had recently moved into had an unfinished roof and no garage door. It stood in front of a main road, totally exposed, overlooking the banks of the River Sava and Croatia. The back bordered on a cornfield where pear, apricot, and apple trees also grew. I'd been surprised months earlier when she'd relocated to this small two-bedroom floor through filled with mismatched uh, with mismatched rugs and elephant and turtle figurines to be with her new second husband, Halil. He was a riverboat captain who didn't make much money. But he has the sweetest heart, she said. We were met by we were led in by Halil, who was tall and quiet with bushy eyebrows. He took our suitcases and gave us cold towels to wipe the sweat from our faces and glasses filled with water from the nearby well. Bisira embraced my mother and told us that Grandma Emina's side of town had been burned to the ground. Thankfully my grandmother had escaped with my cousins. All the men who stayed behind were slaughtered at Luca, Basira cried. My friend Fadila was shot on her own doorstep. Dear God, what did we do to deserve this? Were we throwing rocks at you? She asked the Lord. Two parakeets in bird cages were squawking maniacally. The phones were turned off and there was no electricity. But it was breezy and the sun and the trees surrounding the open windows kept out the direct sunlight. A dozen Muslim refugees we recognized, mostly older female friends of Pisirra's, were sitting on the floor, crying and shaking. They shared stories of husbands and sons who'd been shot and how they'd been herded onto buses by the Serbs and brought here to be used for prisoner exchanges. It's like a ghetto now, 
Becerra said, explaining that everyone who lived in the 50 homes in her subdivision took in Bosniak and Croats so refugees. Kiki, Adisa, how are you? A woman called to my parents. A retired volleyball player Dad had trained limped over to him, a black and green bruise on his forehead. You wouldn't believe what happened. Our Serb friend Kisic beat me with a stick at the mosque. Kisic did that to you? That fucking animal, Dad muttered. I was trying to jump up and touch a live wire on the ceiling to electrocute myself, the volleyball player admitted. But I will never forget you, Keka. If not for you, I wouldn't have even been strong enough to withstand the beating. When you die of old age, I will put up your tombstone. That night, the four of us crowded in Basira's extra room, with Mom and I laying toe, head to toe on the couch, and Eldon and my father trying to sleep on the floor. The rest of the group slept on the floor of the long hallway between the front door and the main bedroom. We had no place else to go. We were stuck there. Despite the circumstances, Basiro was a noble host. She cooked eggs on her wooden stove and served bread, corn, tomatoes, and cucumbers from her garden. Halil gathered peaches, apples, and apricots from the trees and milked the cows. Basira served sour cream she had made. She extracted rose juice from flowers and cleaned clothes with soap and water from the well, then hung them up to dry outside. I played by myself in the backyard, trying to stay out of everyone's way. On June 7, 1992, two weeks after we arrived, Dad and Eldon went to town for their morning sign-up, but never returned. My mother, who was flipping out, completely frantic, ran to find them. I followed her. The streets were deserted. It looked like a ghost town from an old western. As we passed houses in the Muslim village, all the doors and gates were open. Walking down a dirt road, we saw only one soldier. He looked like a young local boy. When we asked about Dad and Eldon, he told us all the Muslim men had been taken to Luka concentration camp. Don't go any farther or you will be taken too, he said in a helpful tone, warning us. Stumbling and sobbing all the way back to Basira's, my mom crumbled into her sister's arms. Beside myself, I ran to the bathroom with the runs, my whole body erupting. It only stopped when Basira's fed me dry coffee grounds. For the next six weeks, we heard nothing about Dad and Eldon, and I felt sick, scared, and numb every day. At night, it was pitch dark, 90 degrees, and there was no air conditioning. Mom and I shared the small couch. I slept on my back with my feet to her head for more room. She worried someone could walk by the ground floor window and shoot us, so she only took a short nap at sunrise. It took me hours to fall asleep amid the sound of crickets, croaking frogs, and gunfire. We were sleep deprived, hungry, petrified that Dad and Eldon might be dead. Trying to be brave for my freaked out and stressed to the core mom, I stayed quiet, spending hours digging sand in the backyard. It was hot and sweaty and I got bitten up by mosquitoes. Mom insisted I wear sweatpants and a long sleeve shirt and put vinegar on my legs to repel the insects. Two older Serb police officers came to the house to check up on us. One fat, one thin. We know the men are at Luca and you're here. We're going to come and get you, too, the fat one threatened, letting us know that Basira's house was left alone only because it stood atop the hill and was exposed to the Croatians across the Sava River. Serb soldiers feared getting shot, so they didn't approach. Also, buses wouldn't fit on the out-of-the-way narrow gravel road. The next day, I was playing on the road in front of the house. I saw a four-door black Mercedes speed by, driven by a soldier in aviator glasses. When I heard shooting, I laid flat on the ground and watched a soldier in black jeans step out of his car, pulled out his RPG, and launched a rocket in the direction of Croatia. After an explosion in the trees, I ran inside and told Mom, 
You could have gotten killed. From now on, you just play behind the house, she said, pissed off. The next morning, I woke up disoriented, ready to meet Piro at karate practice in Birchkow, as if the war were just a nightmare that had ended. But it had barely started. We were running out of food. There was just bread and corn left. The cow and chicken noises we used to hear during the day fell silent. Once the owners had left, no one fed the animals and they died. Basira said mournfully, but the last call she'd received before the phones were cut off gave us hope. Cousin Amila and Mirza had made it to free territory with Grandma Emina. Mirza was listed in the Bosnian, enlisted in the Bosnian army. How I wished I were old enough to join too, but he, we heard nothing about Eldon and Dad. Facing persecution for our faith was especially confusing to me because we weren't religious. I'd entered a mosque only once with my uncle Ahmet in a different town. I didn't fast for Ramadan or pray to Allah. Dad had studied the Quran in religious school when he was young, yet I couldn't make out the Arabic words at all. Mom's grandpa was an imam, but her parents just celebrated holidays. Nobody I knew wore burqas or followed conservative Islam. Women in our clan worked, dressed as they pleased, and bossed their men into sharing all cooking and household chores. In class, we were drilled on Tito's separation of church and state. The Bosniaks, Croats, and Serbs I knew were mostly tall, slim, white people I couldn't tell apart. All their accents seemed the same. Only names gave ethnicities away. But I started pondering whether Serbs had brown eyes or darker hair and skin tone, or if their heads were bigger. After all, our lives depended on whether we could distinguish which guys wanted us dead. I told Bam we should get to Croatia by swimming across the river to freedom in the darkness that would arrive with thunder showers. You are too young, she said. I argued that I'd taken swimming lessons two summers before, but she knew I'd never gone into the deep end without Dad. Even then, I'd worn a life preserver or water wings, which we no longer had. I looked outside the window at the river Sava and felt spooked by the swirling currents. I felt guilty. I was keeping her here. Along both riverbanks, armed soldiers hid in bushes. Even if we reached Croatia, she said, it would be too dangerous to walk through the heavily mined woods to find a road. We didn't know if my father and brother were alive. In bed, I'd shut my eyes, hoping someone was taking care of them, praying that when I woke back up, they'd be with us. But with my heart pounding off my rib cage, I couldn't sleep. Explosions traveled down the river, echoing for miles. My mother couldn't sit still and do nothing. The next time she, the fat and thin Serb police duo came to the house on the afternoon of July 18th, she begged for information about Dad and Eldon. If you really want to know, I can get you to town, said the thin Serb. What jewelry do you have? asked his chubby partner. My mother handed over her gold wedding band and a silver necklace, so they'd drive us to Birch Cow. We got in the back of their blue police Yugo, passing by the checkpoints. I was afraid we'd run into Chetnik, the Chetnik gorilla, but luckily we didn't see him from the back seat and we were quickly waved through. I'm sure they're okay. I lied to console my mom, telling myself that dad knew everyone and nobody would touch him out of respect. But really, I feared every second they were being tortured or were lying in a meat truck, dead. It was a 25 minute drive to the apartment of great aunt Fatima, grandma Edmina's sister, our only other relative in Birchkow. She was 63, with short, black, curly hair. She looked frail when she opened the door with Grandpa Smeige. Smeal. Uh, she kissed and hugged us, and then said, Look who is here. We turned to see Eldon and Dad sitting on the couch in shorts and t-shirts. Eldon was wearing his big yellow framed glasses reading an old soccer magazine. Oh my God, you're here, you're safe. 
My mother shouted, overjoyed. Your life! She cried as we all ran into each other's arms. We heard some of the buses with women and children from Besira's village were blown up, Eldon said. We thought you were dead. He picked me up high, hugged me and messed up my hair. When he put me down, I inspected him and my father carefully. They looked pale, scared, and thinner, but otherwise okay. They had been detained at Luca for two weeks. Then they were among the few men miraculously released from the camp right before the Red Cross first came to report the atrocities to the world. For the last four weeks, they had been hiding at Great Aunt Fatima's place, with no phone lines, electricity, or radio communication available. There had been no way to let us know. Piro is the one who took us to Luca, Dad said. He made the men line up in rows. He walked by and ignored us. I hope someday he turns in his grave. This was the worst Bosnian curse. He wished Piro would never find eternal peace. I couldn't imagine my father wishing Piro dead. I didn't know how to despise anyone yet, especially my beloved coach. The radio station next door to Fatima's apartment became a makeshift Serb headquarters, so we couldn't stay there. We sneaked back to our own home, a seven-minute walk. There were few civilians outside, mostly just passing army trucks and jeeps. We saw one couple looking outside, looking comfortable as if they owned the streets, so we knew they must have been Serbs. Rushing with our with our bags, we feared we looked suspicious and trekked far off the road, underneath the awnings to avoid soldiers. The streets smelled of gunpowder and metal, the sound of heavy and soft artillery in the background like an ongoing symphony. It was spooky, with no lights anywhere. Our feet crunched glass as we walked. I saw bullet casings on the ground. We were unsure what we'd find at our apartment. On the stairwell, we didn't recognize the, neighbor, the new neighbors sitting on balconies in the hot sun. As we reached the top step, we found the door unlocked. A sign read, Property of the Birch Cow Police. Petra sl slunk out of her place next door with a smirk. She leaned against the wall, smoking, smelling of perfume, in my mom's beige nightgown, which she'd helped herself to in the six weeks we'd been gone. She said everyone kept their doors unlocked now, so they wouldn't be kicked in by looting soldiers. A paramilitary commander had been living here, but he'd disappeared. When the conflict ends, Muslims will be defeated, Petra added. The new law dictated we write our family name on the front door in Cyrillic. She insisted we use the Serb alphabet, as if they'd erased our writing, reading, and language too. Nobody was inside our place now, but it was in disarray. The carpet on the floor was twisted. A bath towel with caked-on dirt was draped over the couch. A dining, the dining room chairs were in the living room. The VCR and several of Dad's jazz records were gone. Mom's flowers were dried and shriveled. Even the tree of life, her favorite. If there wasn't hope for the plant, is there hope for us? I asked, wearing down as we tried not to imagine what had happened here within our walls. Petra's in the nightgown Basira gave me. That whore, Mom swore as we checked for what else was missing or damaged. I can't stop her. We're the only Bosniaks left. In both bedrooms, the beds were unmade. It felt dirty to think someone had been sleeping under my covers. The toilets were filled and unflushed. Our always clean house now reeked. When I saw maggots on the kitchen floor, I dry heaved. The white, worm-like grubs came up to my ankles. When I opened the freezer doors, more maggots poured out. With no power, the meat had gone bad and nobody had removed it. The dining room rug was wrecked by combat boot prints, muddy and sunken in. I went to wash up forgetting we had no water, soap, or toothpaste. Mom gave me baking soda to clean my teeth and to use as deodorant, and leftover laundry detergent for shampoo. On her knees, she started scrubbing the soil imprints away. 
we could be killed, and she was worried about her ruined rug. It got on my nerves. Walk softly so the new neighbors on the floor below don't hear us, Mom ordered. We didn't know which of our Muslim neighbors had escaped to Croatia or Germany, who was detained at Luka, how many more were dead. Many families of the Yugoslavian People's Army lived in the building, the nicest complex in town. Eldon guessed that the soldiers hadn't bombed or burned it down because they wanted to keep it for themselves. The new tenants were Serb families who had their own places to live, but stole second homes. Eldon's resistor radio was still in the drawer beneath the TV. He turned it on quietly and searched for the latest news. When I took the maggots out to the garbage and plastic bags, I saw that the Serbs occupying Bosniak homes had tossed wedding and baby albums into the dumpsters. Someone had used a black marker to block out all the faces and heads shown in the pictures. They wanted to erase all signs we had ever lived. I felt we should have swum across to Croatia, or I could have insisted we go with our cousins Amila and Mirza to the free territory where at last at least we had our own army. I wished we had gone to Grandma Emina's a week earlier and made it over the bridge to Croatia before it exploded. We had friends we could have stayed with on the Adriatic coast. At twelve, my head was already filled with regrets. So what are we going to do? I asked my parents. We're stuck here, Mom said. Maybe it'll end soon. In other words, we were screwed. We had a little food or water. Only a few hundred dinars left, but we needed supplies. I was deemed the designated shopper. On the way out to buy bread and oil at the grocery, I bumped into Igor, Velibor, and Dalibor at the bottom of the stairs. Hey, guys, I greeted them, smiling for a second, forgetting we were on different sides now. Hey, Balia is back. Igor frowned as they surrounded me. Don't Turk, Delibor said, rubbing his face with a poster of Alia Izabegovic, the leader of Bosnian Muslims. Kiss your president, Delibor yelled and then spit in my face. Why are you doing this to me? I asked. We're not friends anymore, he said. When his dad returned from the front lines, Delibor said, I hope you killed a lot of Muslims in front of me. Over the next month, I watched from the outdoor stairwell while Velibor, Dalibor, and Igor asked the new kids in the neighborhood to play. When I walked by, they'd slap and punch me. A 15-year-old Serb kid with uh, two heads taller than I, who lived on the fifth floor, came up to me one day, called me Belia, and spit in my face, seething. I wished I was bigger so I could toss him off the balcony and watch him splatter like an egg yolk. I lost it, spun around and gave him a karate kick in the ribs. He kneeled over and grunted. I'd never used martial arts outside of practice before, but I didn't regret it. Even when he chased me up the stairs and kicked me in the back so hard I could barely walk. Why don't you ask Elden to protect you now? Igor left. My, if my brother tried to intervene... Velibor's dad would knock on our door with his AK-47. Hiding inside, Eldon calmly crouched down on the floor, listening to the Free Territory radio station for hours on end, hoping for updates on the fighting. He was like a serene, skinny Buddha who firmly believed we'd survive. He and my dad discussed the war and politics and geography. Mom cleaned as much as possible and made us all a daily small meal with the sardine or apple slice or bread. I played miniature cars, on edge and fidgety, my stomach aching all the time. I felt like an anxious old man with an ulcer. Every day we heard gunfire and vacant homes being broken into with a booming combat boot or by rifle. During the long nights, crouching on the floor by candlelight, Eldon and I would try to guess which weapons were being fired. The noise AK-47s made reminded me of multiple nails being hammered into a door, as I'd heard on construction sites. 
howitzers were like jets taking off from a runway, then firecracker explosions. Mortar rounds seemed like glass smashing. Eldon said RPGs made the sound of a supersonic jet zooming by our window. VBR launchers were the equivalent of 24 rockets taking off in seconds of each other, whereas I heard M48 machine guns as rapid sewing machine. Oddly, days of endless mortar rounds, automatic shot gunshots, and bombs going off soothed me. That meant my old friends would stay inside so they couldn't beat me up. If the sounds indicated the fighting wasn't too close by, I'd walk seven minutes to the closest Turkish fountain on the hill, overlooking Luka. I'd fill two canisters with fresh spring water. There were many ten-foot shishmas with fancy faucets the Turks had built that were still working after hundreds of years. This became our only water supply for bathing and for drinking. It was still summer, so a quick wash did the job. I'd splash my face and underarms and fill my stomach with the cold water. I was starving, so I wanted to feel full for a few hours. Coming home with my mother one day, carrying apples we'd picked from a nearby tree to eat and use as mouthwash, we bumped into one of our new neighbors on the stairwell. He was a Serb kid who looked 15. Mom, he yelled and said, Mr. Keka is back. Baliha returned. He spat at my mother's feet, blocking our entrance. Shame on you, my mom told him. I wanted to boot him in the head like a soccer ball. We stepped over his feet, heading upstairs. The next day, I'd filled two jugs of water. After I'd filled two jugs of water, Igor stuck out his foot and tripped me on the stairs. I fell on my hands, scraping my palms. I punched him while lying on the steps. He spat and slapped me. Dalibor sneaked behind me for a cheap kick. Enraged, Dad came to the terrace, screaming at my old friends, What crawled out of your asses into your heads lately? They looked down, embarrassed. Petra, as ever on the doorstep, told Dad to be quiet. You could be killed for defending him, she said in her pink silk dress and heels. She then walked down to two soldiers looking for apartments to loot, telling them which ones were vacant this week. While Obrin's away, she gets dressed up to flirt with all the soldiers, Mom said disdainfully. One afternoon, when I brought home a used disposable grenade launcher, my mother had a fit. Get it out of here! Don't let anyone see you with it, she told me. They'll think we're firing at them. You'll get us murdered. Another day, I saw the boy who'd spat at my mother, holding empty canisters, walking next to his dad, who wore a red beret. The father was armed with two guns, a knife, and a stick. A cigarette dangled from his mouth. I knew from the red hat that he belonged to a paramilitary group that specialized in looting. Every day, he'd return to his stolen apartment with someone else's stuff. He'd bring home bags full of electronics from abandoned homes. After filling my water containers, I turned toward home, numb and tired. During intense fighting, Mom made Eldon and me sleep on the floor of the long hallway between our bedroom and the dining room in hopes that the intervening wall would protect us from the bullets whizzing by the windows. If we heard a long whistling noise followed by an explosion, that meant a mortar round had landed a safe distance away. If there was a one-second pause after a high whistled, a high-pitched whistle, I'd brace myself against Eldon or the floor, close my eyes, and hold my breath. Everything would vibrate like a guitar string as the walls absorbed the sound wave. Soon, I couldn't fall asleep without the noise. The rare nights of silence became a problem. When the, fa when the father in the red beret came home one afternoon with a bag of candy, a mob of kids surrounded him. I couldn't recall when I last had chocolate. I was sick of beans and bread. Since the man knew my dad, I thought he might give me a piece. He asked me to walk over and said, Tell your father to ask Aliyah to give you some. He meant I should ask our Bosnian Muslim president. The next time I saw him, we were both getting water. 
His son and daughter were with him. I filled my containers. On the trek back, my load was he so heavy I stopped to rest. The three of them caught up behind me. The man took his handgun from the holster and shot my plastic jug. The bullet created two holes, and the water leaked out as they laughed. Nothing lasts forever, I yelled at him, enraged, daring him to shoot me in front of his kids. I told Mom the jug had cracked and I'd thrown it out. Now I saw why Dad wished Piro dead. I felt the same way about my old teammates and nasty neighbors. Two weeks later, a car pulled up in front of our building. Two Serb soldiers with red berets asked where the wife of the candy man lived. Why? That's my dad. What happened? Asked the boy who'd spit at my mother. He jumped on his feet and screamed for his mother. The men were his father's comrades. When they took their caps off and walked up the stairs, I knew they were delivering condolences. The bastard who'd shot my water jug was killed fighting our soldiers, I told Mom the news with a great smile. I couldn't recall the last time I'd smiled. Let God punish them, she said. Remember, they're not all the same. Mr. Orbrin brought you plum jam. He didn't let your dad and Muyo go to Partizan. If Orbrin was, if Orbrin was a good Serb, why did he let Petra steal from us? When she wasn't at her home, she was at ours. She'd enter without knocking, sizing up our furniture, light fixtures, mom's electric iron and other household appliances, the artwork on our walls. Mom gave her whatever she asked for so she wouldn't turn us in. It was a sit dance I hated. One night, Petra wore mom's denim skirt as they sat drinking Turkish coffee. We took turns waiting for the water to boil, handing a metal dish over a ca holding a metal dish over a candle flame. You won't be needing that rug soon. I may as well have it before someone else, Petra said. The next day, Petra invited Mom over to their place for coffee, and I went too. Mom and Petra sat at the table, my mother's carpet beneath their feet. I looked around at the overstuffed boxes in Petra's floor and on the couch. There were blenders, clothing on hangers, boxes of soap, china, wine glasses everywhere. Petra hadn't just been taking our stuff. She'd obviously been looting all the Muslim homes in the building. I pictured how I would feel if I could just enter our neighbor's apartment and take anything I wanted for free without getting in trouble. Would I go for it too? I hoped I wouldn't, that I'd understand it was wrong to take something I didn't earn and know that when they came back they wouldn't miss they would miss it. It had to be bad karma to cash in on someone else's bad fortune. But then I thought of the army equipment I'd swipe with Igor and the guys. Did that mean I was the same as Petra? I consoled myself with Uncle Amit's inference. If I was going to be a thief, at least I'd chosen the right bad guys to rob from. Oberyn let me play with his rifle. I kept pressing the trigger, wishing I could shoot his wife. Did you make sure it's unloaded? she asked him. Unfortunately, it was. Enough playing with the gun, Mom said. One morning, Eldon heard that the Bosnian army had overrun a Serb village. We waited for retaliation. Sure enough, a bus soon pulled up and two soldiers came to our apartment. Our family name written on the door gave our background away. They were taking Eldon and Dad to another concentration camp. Flipping out with fear, I paced back and forth, waiting for Mom, who had gone out for five minutes. I watched from my bedroom window as she ran indoors, asking where they were. They got them again! I told her. I tried not to cry. What do we do? She insisted I stay as she put, as she rushed downstairs, heading straight for the bus with Dad and Eldon inside. I did as she told me, but if they took her away too, I'd be the only one left. I decided I'd swim across the river to Croatia late at night. A half hour passed. I never felt more alone. When they all returned, I was so happy. 
Dad looked ashen. Mom lay down on the couch, out of breath. She couldn't speak, and her hands and legs were trembling. Eldon told me the bus had never left. While they sat there with the other detainees, a police car had pulled up. Mom rushed out of the car, quickly showing a piece of paper to a soldier. Then, Eldon and Dad were allowed to get off the bus. After Mom rested, she told us what happened. It turned out that she had recognized Yovo, a former co-worker who was in charge of detaining men for the camp. He was going to be the bus driver. He didn't want to rescue Eldon and Dad in front of everyone, so he'd hidden in a military jeep, instructing her to go to the police station and to ask for the chief in charge who knew Dad. She told them they were being taken away and requested a document to ensure their release in exchange for giving up our property and leaving the country. The rest of the Muslim men in the bus wound up at the concentration camp. Just in time, she'd saved Dad and Eldon. My mother was my new hero. I felt so horrible, all those poor men staring at me, I wishing I would there to get them off, she cried. The next day, we carried our suitcases onto another bus. We rode for an hour and a half, making it all the way to the Bosnian-Serbian border. Since the bridges to Croatia had been blown up, this was our only possible route out of the country. But two soldiers pulled us off and made us walk back and forth across the bridge while they laughed. Their heavy machine guns pointed down to the river Sava, where the dead floated downstream for miles before passing underneath the bridge an eerie procession of corpses dumped in the water at Luca. To cover the evidence, they'd shot, shoot the bodies full of holes so they'd sink. Back at home, I was hoping our town would be liberated. Every morning, Eldon and I prayed more bombs launched from the Bosnian army would fall on Birchkow. We both agreed we'd rather die this way, knowing freedom was on its way. The day never came. We plugged along in a macabre version of what our lives used to be. Instead of soccer cards, I collected shrapnel and bullets I pulled from building walls. I had 99 sharp pieces. When Eldon and I played poker, we used ammo pellets as chips. Once in the market, I was buying lentils when a mortar round landed across the street. It was fired from Croatia, intended for Serbs, but it didn't clear the building, hitting it instead. The sound shook empty shelves. Customers fell to the ground for cover. I didn't even move. Across the street, a glass window five floors up on an apartment building shattered after a direct hit by a missile. All Croatians should be exterminated, the merchant said. I wanted Croatians from the north and our army from the south to join forces to save us but I kept quiet, or I'd need another place to buy food. There were no other open stores near us. Outside the market, I reached for a chunk of shrapnel. <clears throat> there we go. Thanks for joining us, Nadia. That had just embedded in the doorway frame. It was too hot to touch. I waited until it cooled off before pocketing my souvenir. I stood in the middle of the road and looked up at the fifth story apartment, now missing half its terrace. A moment later, the rest of the balcony crashed down. The scent of burned metal filled the air, smoke diffusing into the sky. On the pavement, I found a larger piece of shrapnel, the size of my forearm. I wrapped it in the belly of my t-shirt so I wouldn't get a blister holding it. In the courtyard, Mom called out, Where were you? You okay? Aha! Look, I got two, I said. The big one is still cooling off. Touch it. When Igor saw it, he was jealous. Where'd you get it? he asked. He's mine, I said. You're not allowed for out for the rest of the day. 
yelled Mom. In September, we first heard the Red Cross was go giving out oil, flour, sugar, and canned food. We'd run out of propane as well. Dad was going crazy indoors. He was desperate for sunlight. So, uh, he walked a mile to the Red Cross food dispensary. 30 people mulled around there. We were dismayed that no international workers were there. We were the only Muslims. Unfortunately, Serb soldiers had already seized control of the donated supplies. Dad and I stood in line, hoping for anything Mom could turn into a meal. Keka, your line is over there, yelled the Serb we knew, Dad's old friend Kisic's wife. We were segregated, instructed to form a new line, just the two of us. After everyone got food, we were given two sardine cans and a package of flowers from a different pile. This pile is for you, Keka, the Serb scowled. On the way home, Dad muttered to himself, a look of hate on his face. Mom checked the expiration of the canned fish, labeled Denmark, 1972. When she opened the flower bag, it was filled with dead black maggots. Probably left over from Vietnam, Dad gasped, shaking his head. I want all the Serbs to die, I muttered, furious. Don't wish that upon anyone, Mom told me. I didn't raise you that way. But look what Perro did. He made me like this, I yelled. They are. The best revenge you'll have is great success. By this time, I wasn't buying it. It seemed like nonsense. Wanting real revenge, I wished I had a rifle to kill all the bad guys who'd mistreated my family. A week later, Dad and I ventured to an outdoor makeshift market. He picked out a tomato and two p potatoes, all we had money for. A Serb woman shouted, Put those back! It's not for Muslims! Everyone stared at us. In time you'll be ashamed, Dad said, putting our lost purchase back. I told Dad to keep quiet and forget about it. As we walked away, a very tall, broad-shouldered, armed soldier in his late twenties approached. I looked up at him. He must have been six foot four. I was apprehensive, not knowing what he wanted. Hi, Keka, what happened? He asked. I never imagined my own town I'd be treated like this, Dad said quietly. What do you want? When Dad told him, the tall man returned with our tomato and two potatoes. Forget about her. Just go home. Is your family okay? Do you need anything else? This is Keenan, your youngest, he asked, patting my head, brushing my hair back. This is Rinko. Say hello, my dad said. I shook Rinko, Rinko's big hand. He wore a camouflage uniform with an AK-47 gun strapped over his shoulder. A handgun in the holster. He touched my dad's soldier and in a low, concerned voice said, Take care of yourself. At home, I told mom that some tall guy named Renko brought the food for us. Renko Sishik? Mom asked. She told me growing up near us in Birchkow, Renko was a troubled kid, a truant he couldn't pass gym class or finish high school without dad's intervention. Renko's mom had begged my dad, Keka, you know all of those professors. They're your friends. Have them go easy on him. After high school, Renko delivered payroll to the company where mom worked. Then, when he made delivery mistakes, mom covered for him. Her co-workers asked her why. She'd say he was a good kid, that she knew his mother. During the war, Renko had been known for torturing Muslims and Catholics in Birchkow. He personally killed dozens. If not with a gun, he'd beat them to death with a bat. He kept my father's college roommate and his wife in captivity. Renko raped her, then shared her among the guards. They even made her husband watch, to inflict the most pain. When Dad was at Luca, Night guards would walk into the warehouse, calling out names. Some men returned beaten up, others never came back. 
When Dad's name was called, he thought it was over, but he was taken to the small office where Rinko shook his hand. How are you, Kekka? Rinko had asked. So you're here with your oldest son, Elden. I want you to know as long as I am here, nothing will happen to you. I knew many good, innocent Bosniaks and Croats had been killed for no reason. Yet amid the surreal chaos, where nothing was fair or made sense, it seemed that all my parents' good deeds added up to a shield just strong enough to keep us alive. But our problems weren't over yet. My mother had been suffering from a toothache, suddenly it worsened, and she ran out of painkillers. We'd heard the local hospital was open only to treat wounded Serb soldiers who had emergencies the doctors would give injections for pain and any medications they had left. We weren't sure if any health services were still working or would help us, but we took a chance. The town was empty as we passed by all the roofless, demolished houses. The infirmary building was shot up with bullets like Swiss cheese. Four doctors, a few nurses, and the receptionist were there with one other patient. We sat in the waiting room where I'd once sat before, having braces made. Mom complained that the entire side of her face hurt. Her head was pounding. I heard fighting outside. I slouched against the outdoor wall. Explosions ricocheted off the infirmary's window. She'll get the other filling. The real stuff's for our kind. I heard a dentist say. They didn't want to fill your cavity with the real stuff, I told her afterward. They saved it for the Serbs. She later learned they used a material like cement. On the way home, a soldier in his teens told us, Don't hang around here. The three must will be blown up in two hours. Open your windows. He thought we were Serbs, I was er, He thought we were Serbs, I whispered to Mom. When we made it back to our place, we unlocked our windows so the glass wouldn't be shattered by the shock waves. Mom opened the balcony. I left my bedroom door ajar to create a breeze. We sat in silence, staring at the clock. At exactly four in the afternoon, a loud explosion roared through the sky. Despite our precautions, our windows shattered. As our three holiest houses of worship were demolished, I heard cheering. My heart cried when I overheard the Serbs downstairs saying that a parking lot would be built on the land where our ruined mosques had stood. Why don't they fear God's wrath? Mom asked. Don't they know he's watching? What God? He left us a long time ago, I told her. He's still here. Don't worry, she said, touching my shoulder. After the horrors we'd witnessed, I couldn't see how the hell she still had faith. That day, we bumped into Milan, the bald soldier from the pyrochemical checkpoint. I'm sorry I couldn't help you, he said, but tell Kika that Sir John's dead. He was captured. He was captured by the Bosniak soldier. He was found hanging by his balls over a pointed fence. At home, I ran upstairs to tell my father that the Chetnik psycho who'd threatened us had been killed. There you go. The motherfucker deserves it, he said. It was the first time he'd ever used that word in front of me. Maybe there was a god after all. <laughs>